Welcome everyone to our fifth live stream of the week in the data on Kubernetes community. Uh, this is our fifth, but in, in no ways the least important and perhaps the most directly related to a lot of the stuff that we're talking about within the data on Kubernetes community with a person who has loads of experience dealing with it. Michael Cade is no stranger to the world of stateful workloads on Kubernetes and his role is senior global technologist in Kasten, which we're going to hear a little bit more later. He's given plenty of talks. If you look for his name in different podcasts, he's done stuff with the new stack, done stuff in different places, um, plenty of video content as well. I don't know how you're able to stay up <laughs> to date with all this stuff. Uh, Michael, welcome. Very nice to have you with us today. Hey, Bart. Happy to be here. Yeah. Finding some time to sit down and chill out and talk more more kubernetes more data is, is all good yeah very good so how did you uh how did you get involved in, in the data world in general and then could you just tell us about how that led into your current role and what does a senior global technologist do uh, um so i've been so I, it goes back many years to starting out building servers building computers tinkering around as a technologist back out of school college type thing mm -hmm. And then having an interest around just in general infrastructure uh, back in the day when it was physical machines, then it went to virtual, then a bit of cloud. Now we're into the cloud native world, but really it's a progressive like timeline there. And uh, then I had a big, a really big light bulb moment around like, an interest around storage. But I got in with the likes of NetApp, HPE, Nimble at the time and like I was very, very intrigued by storage. And obviously storage is where we store our data. So then that led to me being really interested in data. And then I joined Veeam around six years ago to focus on, I was an SE to begin with. So on the dark side of sales and, and keeping salespeople honest. Um, but we were talking about data management. We were talking about protecting data here, there and everywhere. And then six months ago, only six months ago, but it feels like a longer, longer time in this world. But I got moved over to Kasten, which is a company that, that Veeam acquired back in October 2020. And they're focused on Kubernetes data management. So really focused on cloud native, cloud native, living and breathing that uh, I think the term is eating their own dog food, but drinking champagne <laughs> is much better. Um and, uh, and really focused around protecting Kubernetes applications. So those stateful workloads that we know we're seeing a lot more of in our in our space, um, things like MySQL and just general databases, NoSQL databases, et cetera. Um, so yeah, that's a very quick overview of where I've come from, um, but a global technologist. Now this word or this title, it's a, it's a tough one for us. Like it, it's a bit of a, so a, a technologist is, is in general someone that plays around with technology and my focus is around community but also around content so technical content technical community and a lot of, like I don't mind the sound of my own voice so they stick me in front of people mm -hmm. and I talk a lot about the technology and stuff that I find out and try and stay away from the the sales mantra and the whole pitch and stuff so yeah hopefully it's interesting what we're going to talk about we're not actually going to be talking about Kasten. we're going to be talking about an open source project that we've been involved in or, or contributing to mm -hmm. over the last six six months so yeah we um we should be able to show some of the stuff that we've we've been up to but also what it does and i think that's the that's the key right that's great and i think also with what you said you know with this role as a you know technologist is that how you explain things. And, and I really do recommend folks out there to, to check out some other interviews with Michael and you'll see that this, this tone and way of expressing yourself is, is quite consistent in, in the sense of, you know, helping people learn, making these things easier. And that's a lot of what, you know, we're trying to achieve is that we understand that there are challenges related to running data on Kubernetes. And, and so let's, you know, get together and share best practices to make that, those things easier. So now that we got that part, you know, in terms of your professional role, can we get to know Michael a little bit better as a person? I mean, I know that you have interest in some sports. Can you tell us what they are? Yeah, so I'm a massive rugby fan. Uh, in fact, I've just taken, like, I've had three years off. I'm getting a bit old. Things are starting to hurt a little bit more now. <laughs> um, but actually, the pandemic has opened up the door to, well, actually, I'm going to go back because everyone's going to be a bit rusty uh, around here. So I'm going to go back and play just a lot lower level. I was playing in the third tier of English rugby. So it was, it was good. Um, bunking off work and I shouldn't probably say that this is going out on YouTube for everyone. Um, but ultimately <laughs> I was playing rugby, 
like at quite a good level. I was being looked after from a financial perspective and all of that good stuff. So, and uh, yeah, I encourage anyone that plays sports that gets the opportunity to do that, hundred percent, do it um, mm. because it, yeah, it's good. But um, and then really, my other like hobby is around tink- tinkering with technology. It's pretty sad, but I imagine everyone watching has that same hobby, right? Um, learning new things. Uh, but then also like just spending time with the family uh, even more so over the last 18 months as everyone has had. Um, but yeah, that they're really my, my key focuses around playing sport, rugby, watching rugby, anything rugby, you'll, you'll see me glued to the, the TV or even there if I can be. That's good because I think, I think there are two things interesting to hear about rugby is like, uh, I, you know, I played rugby many, many years ago and in, in, in high school. And, and so it was very, it was quite informal and, and, and it, you know, it was American. So a lot of people coming from an American football background, which is not the best way I think to understand it because they're just completely different sports. Um, and anyway, so there are different things that, that happened there, but two things is that I think um, from a learning perspective, I think they would be curious to see how you can relate your journey as a technologist, as well as, you know, how you started out playing the sport, you know, really getting good at a sport is difficult for everybody. It's not something that happens overnight. I think also as well, too, we see in the Kubernetes world is that there's a learning curve and there's a process. There are going to be some painful moments and you're going to fall down and, and you're going to get hit and all that kind of stuff. But then I think what's also really interesting about rugby is that I, I've never played a sport that has such a strong community focus where people really take care of each other, both on and off the field. That's a big thing is, I would say what happens off the field is just as important and sometimes more important than what happens on the field. So in your experience, do you think you can kind of relate, like I said, both the, you know, individual progress as well as then the community side of it too? So I'd never really put the two together, um, to be honest. But yeah, I think, I think what you're saying is, is it ab- absolutely that, and it probably does pave the way for my like foundation from a community standpoint is that, I have a kind of an ethos around, right, I write a lot of content, blogs, and then more recently, a lot of YouTube videos. And people, like some some really hit the ground running and you get thousands of views and some not so good, but they're the ones that you probably spend the most time on. And you could kind of relate to that into a game, right? You could have, you could come off the field absolutely dripping in sweat, probably blood everywhere. You've lost the game, but you've put everything into it. And they're the games that you remember the most, even though you lost. And sometimes they're the games where you remember the other people that have got down in the trenches with you. And they're the ones that you've helped along the way. And I I see that as well from a a blog or a content creation point of view is that the only, I, I only write, I write one for myself. I really enjoy it, but also going back to it as a reference, because I can't remember everything, but I always feel like people ask like, why do you bother? Why do you do it? And really, there is one answer, and it is, if I can, if that helps one person, just one, I don't really care if it's 10,000 or just one person, then it's worth it. And that's the same, like, with rugby, is that all you do, like, you go out there, as soon as you go over that field, you're not there, it's not an individual sport, there is no way you can win that game on your own. You're relying on the other 14 guys or people that you're playing rugby with, and if they all don't, if we don't all swim in the right direction, then we're never gonna, we're never gonna learn, we're never gonna get better. And I think that, yeah, I think now that you've said and kind of put them two together, that's a, that is a huge thing. But yeah, um, and then on the learning side, is that we know there's there's ups and downs whenever you're learning, whether it's a new technology like Kubernetes or whether it's just a case of learning something more simple like a less less complex less daunting uh like all there's ups and downs right there's days where you're absolutely going to dive in and you're going to learn you're going to absorb everything that you possibly can and you're going to come out of that more knowledgeable about the subject that you're learning same as a rugby field you're going to go out some days you can score 100 100 points but actually what what help does that that give do you learn anything yeah okay we've we've put all of our our uh, practicing or we've put all of our learning into practice and we're scoring all the tries and that's great but you necess- don't necessarily learn anything from that it's the it's the really hard games where you really learn about yourself and your teammates and I think that's the same with us and you can liken that to, to Kubernetes or Cloud Native is that 
like the hut it is a bit hard it is a bit daunting and some like it's not just one area is daunting every area whether it's networking storage like data it's all like potentially daunting it's getting better but we have to get there as a team as a community to to help engage and encourage everyone around that that's great. A fantastic response. And I think that speaks a lot to because when we get newcomers that are coming in and I think they're very often seen as an individual perspective, how do I learn Kubernetes? And the answer is, if you're only thinking as an individual, it's going to go much slower. As soon as you can get into a SIG, as soon as you can start uh, contributing in some kind of way. And I always tell people just having a positive attitude and going to meetings, that's enough. You know, like That's more than enough. Um, so anyway, I think that's very, very well explained. And, and there's lots that can be learned from that. You know, I got some other questions, but I think it's, can we, you know, with, with that being in, in mind and from also listening to some of your other interviews is, you know, this, this fact that it is daunting and storage is no exception when it comes to the, that overwhelming kind of feeling. And when an end user is going to get in there and Kubernetes is already crazy enough and you're like, and now I got to start thinking about storage. So how can this be simplified? I think that's kind of where Coopster comes in, if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So yeah. what, was the back, what was the background behind that? What, what led to this project? What's the question that it's answering? You know, like how did this sort of come to fruition? So regardless of wherever you've got storage, whether it's in a virtualization world, whether it's in Kubernetes, storage is relatively hard. A lot of storage vendors make uh, have been trying to make storage much easier to consume and use and all of that good stuff. But ultimately, when you get to the into the thick of it, you're very much reliant on like, understanding what your workload requires and also how um, like you benchmarking, we need to understand a lot more about identifying what that looks like. Just there's no one expert in Kubernetes storage or storage in general. People know a lot but there's a lot about a lot that you need to learn as well. And I think one thing that I'm finding from a Kubernetes, a DevOps, a cloud native world is that you actually don't need to know. You don't have to be a master of everything or a master of one thing. You need kind of need to be a bit of a jack of all trades to be able to just get stuff done because there's like you mentioned, the special interest group that they're, they're focusing on as a community, a smaller community within a bigger community. They're focusing on making things better um, and working like the prime example there is the CSI driver, right? A few years back, we didn't have the CSI driver. The SIG comes along that creates something called the, the container um, storage uh, initiative or the uh, integration point with, with the storage. And now we can consume lots of different storage vendors without having to rely on entry provisioner code and, and a more complex way of looking at it where it was. Now we've got CSI, we've got a much easier way of consuming storage, but that doesn't take away the complexity of storage, especially when it comes to Kubernetes can run anywhere, right? Um, we can run it at home on our Raspberry Pis, we can run it in public clouds, we can run it on-prem, in virtualization, like literally it can run anywhere. And when you get into the public cloud world, then you've got all of the different options because just because you've created a three node or a 10 node cluster, depending on what that node type is, well, that reflects on what storage you have available, but also what performance of that storage you have available as well. So then you start to get this overwhelming, like, oh, I have to do this. Like, I thought that my compute node was just going to enable CPU and memory for my application, but now I have to consider what my storage is as well so that I can have the back end. And it, like, there's so many moving parts. And then that's just storage. Now you've got to think about the same thing for networking and compute and your application and you've got to learn about yaml files and you've got to learn about this that and the other but so cubester's real focus at the very high level is to identify kubernetes storage that you have available to you uh, va uh validate that your storage is configured correctly especially csi storage that's very new within the kubernetes distribution but then also va uh, evaluate that as well so get some sort of benchmarking what is my storage capable of within within the Kubernetes storage ecosystem? So they're, they're kind of the three easy buttons. I've been I've <clears> spoken <throat> a lot about Kubester, and I, I call it the easy button, the easy button for storage within Kubernetes. Now, obviously, there's a long roadmap in my head about where we could go with this. I'm not a developer. I have a, a team that are looking after this as well, but obviously, open to the community. If anyone's got great ideas, I'll uh, there's links that we'll we'll share afterwards, right? But 
yeah, fundamentally, it's about easing that, easing you in, easing everyone in to the Kubernetes storage world because it's a world within a world, and it can uh, everything's daunting. And I think that's a that's the the one hundred one level of what Kubester is. Okay. Um... Very well explained. And I think also as well as because you mentioned that you did have, you know, uh, some experience working in, on the sales side, which gets a really bad reputation, but they're humans that got to eat and breathe at the end of the day too. <laughs> but I'm just saying is that because from a sales perspective, you go out and interacting with a customer and you've got to sell this, you know, like you said, the easy button. I mean, for a salesperson, that's almost like, I couldn't make this simpler. Uh, we know this is, and this is also one of the things that I read recently. There, There's some, in, some new research that came out that with Kubernetes, you know, the cost factor in terms of expenses for, you know, typical things of your AWS bill or things like that, like that's one factor. But for one of the reasons why there's a lot of reluctance is the knowledge gap. And, you know, that there is, that there are professionals that are well-equipped and obviously that translates into another type of cost. But I think it's because like th that for an end user that they don't need to feel that they need to become an expert on storage to understand these things. I think that's where this easy button kind of thing comes in and where it does add some value. Yeah, for sure. Um, and you bring up a great point as well, Bart, because as much as this is about, like it can help from a day one point of view, okay, I need a Kubernetes cluster because I've got this application or these applications that I'm going to deploy. I want to make sure that I get off on the right foot and I use Kubester to understand what the storage is underlining that and, and everything around that. But what about existing like you've got some people have got clusters that have been around for years what about like potential storage that is available to that cluster that you're especially in the public cloud you're paying for that so and it's sat there potentially doing nothing now obviously and i'll put a big caveat in here it depends on the cloud depends on if you're using it but also think about the if you're running a an expensive node type in a public cloud and you were running it because you were running a specific storage uh like a storage focused project and you needed the big node to be able to do that and so on and so forth and then that that project went away but you kept the nodes you've got your application you're potentially paying a lot more money for the stuff that you're running and you have no idea about that unless you go looking for it but you're seeing the bill come in on a monthly basis and you're well, the job's getting done and business is, a, business is good, all of that good stuff. And that's another area where Cubes can can help there. And I guess that, that another good point, Bart, that you make, and what Cubes is doing is kind of bridging that education gap, that knowledge gap. You don't need to, you don't really need to know much at all. I mean, when I first started looking at, at Cubester from an open source perspective within Kasten, I'd not really played too much from a Kubernetes point of view. Now, I knew what, and one of the things that we use in inside of Kubester is flexible IO. So a benchmarking tool goes back decades, right? We've been using it to test disks and storage for many years in the virtualization, in the physical world. And what uh, Sarish, who's the head developer for Kubester from a custom point of view, mm -hmm. he basically took that flexible IO and packaged that up into a, a, an automated pod structure and that gives us the ability to go and send that out and pull back that information, that benchmarking information from your storage from a simple thing. And we can get into it. I can show a demo of this later on. It's really simple. But I hadn't, so I didn't know really the constructs behind Kubernetes at the time around namespaces and pods and persistent volume claims and persistent volumes. All of this was like, I have no idea what this is. But I was able to pick up this binary, this tool, and run it against the cluster and get some feedback from that. And then one of the big pointers that, that Sarish made was it's not necessarily around um, just the storage that's available. It's also these nodes and the node sizes that I mentioned. And he actually did a really, really good blog on more, not a comparison because that's not fair to, to do, but because as much as these node sizes and storage types are like they're giving some they're giving some space to store some store or some data mm -hmm. they're not necessarily the same between azure and google so you can't compare them but he did a really good analysis over four different public clouds DigitalOcean, aks azure google and it came back with like you change the node size you you get more 
IOPS, you change the storage type, you get more IOPS, you bring it down. There's so many moving, like you feel like a bit of a DJ, but there's lots of different like uh, like tuning things to that you can you can play around with to get the right to get the right um, storage IOPS or the right storage throughput. The blocks are is an endless, but what this tool does is really simplify that. I think is the is the key takeaway. Very good. Can, can we take a closer look at it? Yeah, yeah. Let's um, let's do it. In. Yeah, you don't need to be looking at my face for. Oh, <laughs> don't worry. Well, so, that's, a, uh, that's a lovely background, by the way. Yeah, it's moving as well. I don't know what that does to the to the um, to the stream, but hopefully, so hopefully everyone can see the text. Okay, so basically, what I've got here is I've got a, uh, and just for the demo purposes, I'm running a, an AKS three node cluster with a particular type of, of nodes. Again, this is just to emphasize what it can do, but you can see what version I'm running. You can see how late I left it to spin up the demo, um, but we're going live no matter, it, it should work. Um, and first of all, I've gone to, uh, let me, spin up a new tab and show you where to find more information first as well. So kubester.io is where everyone should start there uh, like to learn a bit more if I haven't explained it particularly right or in more detail. Um, this explains what it is. So it's a collection of tools. It's basically one binary that's going to enable you to discover, validate and evaluate your Kubernetes storage options. So it gets through that. There's a little demo on there. It then says about using Kubester. So within Kubester, we have various different releases. So you can see here that we're, we're running 0.4.18. And you can see a couple of different binaries that are available. So one is for your, your ARM processor, or at least your, um, your Mac, uh, Linux, Windows. We do have the ARM binary that we're working on from a code release or a branch out there as well. So we'll get that in there. But um, really, all you need to do is go and download that binary and, and get things up and running. The other nod that I'll say is and another community project out there is Arcade. And uh, we have the ability also to deploy the, the binary for Kubester within there. So simply, if you've got Arcade, which is a package manager for or a marketplace for Kubernetes applications, if you go Arcade get kubester then it will download the relative or yeah the uh the binary that you need for your operating system and then you've got the ability to run that so if we kick things off with a kubester help you can see what this does uh let's run a help and, and of course quick shout out to alex ellis for our okay, yeah yeah huge community face as well and massive massive i mean it's I, I don't know where he gets the time but it's incredible so he lives like 10 minutes away from me which is a, a freaky um freaky uh thing especially no one lives around me that does computers that is um so cubes to help so this gives us a bit of an understanding of well what is available so i've already kind of touched on Running Kubester on its own, which we will we'll do in a sec, is going to give us that highlight. What storage do we have available to us within the Kubernetes storage? So is it going to identify? But then we've got two other areas. We've got the CSI check. So what the CSI check is going to do is it, it's going to perform a, it's going to create a pod with a PVC. It's going to add some data. It's going to snapshot that. It's then going to delete that. It's going to confirm that your CSI is configured correctly. Those of you that have used the CSI driver, um, it's not as straightforward generally, especially if it's in like a feature preview. It's not generally out of the box working. You've got to add some level of volume snapshot class or something to it to make it fully work. Now, there is a little bit of a, an addition here is that we obviously use this tool from a custom point of view around data management because we leverage the, the volume snapshot class to make that happen. So we've really just ported that code point from our own or from the Kasten K10 platform into Kubester. And then, so that gives us the ability to validate that our CSI is configured correctly. And then we have our FIO, which is using flexible IO. Again, it's gonna create a pod with a minimum OS. 
it's then going to run against the persistent volume that you choose to or against the storage class that you wish to do it against and then it's going to give you back but instead of me just telling you that it's probably a good thing to show so if i clear this and i run just cubester you're going to see just out of the box from the from the uh from just running the the cubester binary you're going to see it gives us some information one it gives us obviously a pretty logo no CLI is, is complete without a, a logo. Um, but it's then going to do some validation checks. So this is based on the cubes, Kubernetes context that you're running in. So if you've got multiple, you can flip between them. You can run Kubester. You can get that information. And it's then going to make sure that we've got enough role-based access control to go and deploy a pod with what we've got, with the access that we have within our kube config. Can I, can I touch on one thing really quickly, just because this came up in a conversation yesterday um, cool. about regarding RBAC and particularly related to, to data on Kubernetes. From this perspective, because also you were talking about, we're looking at the day two stuff, and we see this also with policy engines, we see this with OPA, we see this with Kiverno, et cetera. Trying to make, trying to tame the beast a little bit in terms of Kubernetes, when it comes to storage and you know the access control kind of stuff, who really needs to be getting into this? Who doesn't, it shouldn't be their concern. In your perspective, uh, you know, where, where do you get those guardrails in? Uh, who really needs to be in there in terms of what kind of roles and, and who really just doesn't have a horse in this race? So I think everyone, everyone needs to, especially in a Kubernetes environment, everyone needs to be aware of security. It's least privileged. Everyone needs to be aware of that. I think we, we have to learn from mistakes that we've made previously in infrastructure where, God mode was okay. We we definitely can't have God mode in uh, in in our in our Kubernetes environments. It has to be least privileged and make sure that the people that have access are the the ones that need access. Um, I think that might be a bit of a cop out there, Bart, in, in terms of the answer. But I think no, no, not at there. all, not not at all, not at all. Because I, it's something that that I've experienced in different organizations as well, different companies where. Uh, there would be complaints about, oh, you're clipping our wings or by putting these guardrails, we're not being able to fully innovate. But like you said, when there's a heavy price tag that comes along for, for having you know, open environments where there isn't that kind of clear and transparent uh, you know, governance and who has access to these things, the, the, the risks can be, can be quite scary. So like I said, also, I think that a, a lot of what we're talking about here and also an easy button on Kubernetes is that up until now, or you know, in the last seven years or several years, you know, that with Kubernetes, the battle has been how can we make this a more controlled environment that's more predictable, that's kind of harnessed, um, so that also once again for end users that, that can be simpler as well. And I think that this plays an important role. That's just why I wanted to touch on that because I think it's something that's gonna that's gonna keep coming up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And security is such a hot topic. And I'd go even one step further: is that like we're, a lot of us are creating our own Kubernetes clusters, spinning up, spinning down. And we all need to live by that same motto of least privilege. Now, it's much when you're labbing, it's much easier to, I'm going to give myself everything. I'm going to give myself access to everything. I think we need to get into the mindset of, okay, I'm going to create user accounts that are representative of maybe my, my uh, company or, and I'm going to, I'm going to run through those scenarios and, like OPA and, and OIDC, different authentication methods, they're all relevant to go and learn. And they all sound like, for me, I've never been a massive fan of like learning security until really you have to, because security is everywhere and it spans from everything as well. Like it is literally from a provisioning point of view, but right through to like code, code deployment, like how vulnerable, how many vulnerable vulnerabilities do we have within our code? That is a huge topic. And I'm not saying you have to be an expert in it unless that's obviously what you want to do, but you have to have a foundational knowledge. And it kind of goes back to what I said about at the beginning is know a, know a lot about a lot of things. I think that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that, that kind of like you can drill down and be an expert in security or storage or wherever you need to be, but have a broad understanding of the whole ecosystem because that's going to allow you to pick and choose and find the, the right position or the right tool that or the right area that you want to be exposed to as well by having that understanding. Perfect. Crack on. Let's go. So 
yeah agri- uh, so we're gonna make sure that we've got access it's gonna actually this is this is kind of important it's annoying when it comes up but it's also important that we're going to go away and we're going to have a look at the csi driver that we have installed in our kubernetes environment so you can see here that we're using the csi driver uh in version 119 i think i'm using version 120 point something and we know that come 22 1.22 of kubernetes is that well that csi that v1 beta is going away it's going to be v1 so a lot more people are going to be rolling out that as ga we have to be aware of that because when we're upgrading all of our yaml all of our manifests are going to be talking about v1 beta so it's just a, another nod to say okay that need, we need to remember that when it comes around but it's just another way of like again giving you that information very quickly very easily um, and then we get into the available storage provisioners. So out of the box, I said I'm using Azure. So we have um, entry provisioners. So we have our Kubernetes IO. So this is what's built into the Kubernetes distribution that we're using. And generally speaking, out of the public clouds, this is by default today. By default in the next releases, then you're going to see that they're going to roll out to the CSI. So these will then, they'll still be available because people are obviously using them, but they're going to be deprecated in a later release. Now, from here, we don't have that snapshot capability, so we can't run that CSI check because it obviously doesn't have that functionality. But we can run that speed test, that evaluation, that understanding of block size and, and IOPS and throughput. So we can still run that, and I'll get to that shortly. Then you get to see that we've got a CSI driver, and we announced that this is a CSI driver. And it gives us some information about that CSI driver and where it came from. And this is in particular for the Azure file. So we have file and we have disk within Azure. There might be other ones that depend on the public cloud that you're using. You might have others as well. But this is where we're going to understand that this is a CSI driver. It's using the CSI um, like API. It's using the, that, that part. And then this gives us the ability to say, okay, there's storage classes aligned to this called Azure File hyphen CSI. So this might be uh, like a, a bronze tier or a silver tier of storage with X amount of performance that Microsoft know and they'll tell you about. And then there's also Azure File CSI Premium, which might link itself to your gold standard, which gives you more throughput or my, more capacity. I don't know the ins and outs of what that looked like. And then we've got a snapshot class that has also been created that enables us to create volume snapshots. And within Kubester, we give some information about, okay, if you want to run the FIO test, run this. But if you also want to test that CSI snapshot functionality, then run this. And we'll get to that shortly. You see another entry provisioner here. Again, the Azure disk. You're going to see like Azure file and then the Azure file CSI driver. Then you're going to see the Azure disk and the Azure Disk CSI driver, giving us that same information all the way through, right? So, and we can validate that as well. So if I run the kubectl get storage class, you can see that I've got all of these different storage classes available. You can see that they're all underneath either the disk or underneath the file. So quite a lot of options when it comes to, well, and if you don't know storage and you don't know Azure, like this becomes a bit overwhelming. Like, where do I put my MySQL database? Where do I put that? And maybe you know what the load is going to look like. You know what is needed from it. But which one, which which is best? Like, I know that premium normally means that it's going to be the best, but is premium better than managed CSI or is file better than disk like, and so forth? So there are a couple of, so this is out of the box. This is what you'll first get if you run that. But then obviously we want to start to validate that that storage is, is configured correctly. So what we're going to do here is we're going to open, uh, we're going to run a CSI check uh, against the managed CSI and the volume snapshot class. So again, if we, let's kick that off. If I then move myself out the way. So you can see that this starts by creating an application. Uh, what I want to do is open another one and I'm going to do a kubectl get pods and you can see here that I'm creating a, a container within my default namespace we can define where that goes if you want some something particular but 
we're creating that pod. Shouldn't take very long at all. We can also then go and see what our PVCs look like. You can see that we have a PVC that has been created. And actually, you can already see that we've started to clone that. And if I'm quick enough, you might see that that's bound as well. And if I see pods, you're going to see a restore or a cloned. And again, we're, we're creating that other pod, which is going to attach that cloned PVC. And that's going to confirm that our volume snapshot class is actually working correctly. But then what we're going to do is get rid of it as well. So, okay, we've validated that everything's good. We've done everything and that should actually be gone any second now in a live demo. But if I head back here, you can see that, okay, we created the application. We created a pod that we saw and we created a PVC, which is where we're going to store our data on that managed CSI. Um, if you if you did see it, um, then we're going to create a snapshot and then we're going to restore the data from that snapshot to a new pod and a new PV or we're going to take the clone PVC and then we're going to go away and we're going to clean up and then we're going to come back and give you a big green tick to say that the CSI application successfully snapshotted and restored that whilst also making sure he says this should all be gone. Yeah, and then everything's gone. So that's us validating that the storage is, is complete. So then we want to actually evaluate our storage. And I just want to show this because this is, this is where things get a little bit interesting as to what we can actually achieve in uh, with, from, a, from an evaluation point of view. Because this is where we can bring your own FIO files. Now, for those not familiar with FIO, FIO is really a set of configurations that enable us to go, okay, my, my workload runs a backwards read. It's a restore validation. I want to make sure that everything runs out like that way. I want to be able to read everything within my system volume as quick as possible. Or I want to test sequential read writes and see what's capable of doing that. Now, for that, we have to start defining a few things. Now, we could out of the box just use the default settings but I can't remember off the top of my head what that looks like. But if we were to just run Cubester FIO um, FIO hyphen S, which is a storage class, and then manage cluster uh, manage CSI, then you're going to see what this does is go and create that PVC and just run the default setting, and then it's going to spit back a an output to that, which we'll see shortly. But obviously, we can still see what we can throw into this as defining what we want to actually send. And then I'm going to run through some of these. So like I mentioned, we can get from the FIO file, we can add that in and you can see um, here, I'm actually, I've got a group of FIO files. FIO is also open source, has been forever. Um, and there's a lot of community FIO files that enable you to go and test. So I said about the backwards read. Um, again, if I quickly jump over here, you're going to see... that I've got a pod up and running. If I do a kubectl get PVC as well, you can see that. And that's where that test is going on in the background, just the, the default test. Running the FIO test here on this and a default size of 100 gig. I'll get to that shortly. But really, like so I said about the backwards read, I want to validate that my storage is the quickest it can be at reading data backwards. It could be backup storage. And I want to make sure that my restores are going to be as fast as possible. So with that, I'm going to take a community FIO file and I'm going to do something around the block sizes is a 4K block. Read and write, I want to use 8, 8K. I want to do it in increments of 128 file, uh, file size, 128 meg, and so on and so forth. And we can go to this one and you can see there's a bit more information in here about how many concurrent jobs do you want to happen here? How many like streams of data? What does the file look like? What size of the data looks like? What the IO engine and the IO depth look like? But really what this is really focused on is someone else has already done the heavy lifting to understand what the workload potentially looks like. So this would, this would lend very well to a database. This would lend very well to a, a restore or some sort of scraping type tool. So people have already done the hard yard, so you don't have to learn how to write an FIO file. Just go and pick one off, off the community. So back to our terminal, and you can see here that we've got 
a bit of an output. So we can see that we create, to begin with, we created that pod that we saw, uh, sorry, the PVC that we saw, so the persistent volume claim. You can see that we have our pod that we created to sync up and do the FIO test. And then we ran that FIO test within that pod against that storage class, against that PVC, the default size being 100 gig. We can see that it took 50 seconds to, to run. Obviously, some like that will vary depending on what you're actually throwing at it. And then here we've got our test results. What, what actually did we do? So we did some read IOPS with a default block size of 4K and a file size of 2 gig. And this is the default because we didn't define that FIO file. And you can see that we then did some write ops and then read and then some more writes. And that gives us a, an output of what those disk stats look like, what the IOPS were. And if I had another environment ready, we could compare them. We could go and create another AKS cluster. We could change the size of the nodes. We can start really honing in on what we, what we actually need um, from a storage perspective. So back on the uh, tests... So I mentioned about the default storage being 100 gig. Well, maybe that's too small. So maybe we want to dictate what it actually looks like. And maybe I want to then output everything to a um, out to a, a, a JSON file so that I can then import that into a different tool that gives us some visualization or gives us some test. And this is really where we're hoping that um, the community get behind this and start sharing uh, like different node, different storage tiers, different storage classes, so that, okay, they've done the hard yards and then ran Cubester, but what about the comparison? We can then go to a library within the GitHub page or the GitHub repository, and we can start to simply look. We don't have to go and spin up these clusters. We can actually just go and, and leverage someone else's effort, which is obviously all about, about community at that point. We're sharing our, our findings. So Let's just quickly run this one, which is we're going to change that default um, disk size to 400 gig this time. And we're going to run that against our, our the same, the same uh, PVC and pod deployment. But obviously, we expect to see something different. And if we have a look at, let's take this one, for example. So our reads for block size 4K, file size 2 gig was let's say 1250. We just need to remember that 1250 and see if it comes back any different because the size of the disk that we're now deploying is bigger. And this is where if you unravel what we're actually doing, like if you were to manually go and do this, like this is why people aren't doing this because it's overwhelming. Like it changes. There's so many moving parts, so many different, like you've got managed disks, you've got um, performance tiers, you've got different node sizes, there's just so many different options that it doesn't doesn't really help get, get to where we want to be um, from a storage. We want to really hit that easy button. So 1250 is what we're remembering, or we can remember all of them, we're going to see them up there, but this should take, but you can see here that uh, again, if I go in and just check the PVCs, we've got our PVC that's now 400 gig as opposed to 100 gigs. So we've defined a difference. We've got our pods as well that's up and running. It's been up for 80 seconds. And it shouldn't take too much time. And then you saw that I outputted. I wanted everything into a JSON, JSON file that I could then lift and shift this out into a different a third-party tool. Now, I would love for the community to come up with a way of being able to export this into an actual tool maybe a, a Grafana or something that gives us a better input than just JSON. But we can see here that this gives us all of that information, all of the, the results. We can see that it took about the same time. We can see in here, and it's a lot harder to read in JSON, uh, but the IOPS was very much the same. So changing that disk size, because we didn't change the file size, didn't really make any difference at all. But in some areas, if we went to maybe a terabyte, that might change what that storage looks like within um, within uh, Azure or within any any Kubernetes environment. Now, if we then, just to wrap the demo up a little bit, is that if we then wanted to bring your own FIO, so let's say about that backwards read, we wanted to see how that looked. 
I've obviously downloaded or get cloned that that repository of FIO examples, and I can then just run this Cubester FIO against my environment that I know is going to be used for some sort of scraping. That won't work. Let's uh, try that again. Why are you? Oh, that does want that. Let's do that. Good stuff. So it can't find the repository in there, but ah, I know why. Live demo. This That's is. why it's a live demo. So if I just okay, bear with me. It's all good. You were mentioning, you know, earlier rugby coming off the field, lots of blood and sweat. Well, that's what we're getting right now. Right? There you go. This is, yeah. this is me doing it to myself. Uh, in fact, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do that. Manage CSR not found. Is that because I'm in a different cluster? Um, CTL get SC. I think, yeah, I'm on a different cluster on this. Um, so, cube config get context, cube CTL config use context. I want to go over to my Azure cluster and then we can run that. Okay, good stuff. So that's going to go away and that's going to run that backwards read against my managed CSI storage as well. So that particular test that we see here, which is simulating that scrape or read in um, files backwards is, is here. And these are just examples. The other one takes a, a hell of a long time to, to, to do anything with. Um, but so that's going to go away and it's going to run that test. And without... I think I can show you what these FIOs look like. And if you, I'll, I'll try and figure out how to share the GitHub location, but you can see in here that under examples, there's hundreds. Yeah, loads, yeah. So what something is gonna fit like, and it could be one meg clients, it could be at AIO reads, backwards reads, basic verifiers, butterfly, like there's various different historic benchmarking that, that you'll see in there. But you can see here that we ran that backwards um, thing. It only took seven seconds. We automated it with uh, 4K block size, file size 128 meg, 8K. You can see that from a read point of view, we got nearly 8,000 IOPS, which is different to your 1250 that we had from a like a forward read, I guess. Um, and basically, that's all we tested against. The other thing before like we, before we wrap up and I don't know if this works, but I was able to take, so a lot of people have been, or at least, at least in my community circles, a lot of people have been looking at, at kubectl um, plugins. So I was thinking like, and I'm no developer by, by any stretch, but um, there's a lot of useful things in kubectl and, uh, and obviously we spend a lot of our time in kubectl. Now, one of the benefits of Cubester is the ability to every now and again, just have a bit of an understanding of what the storage looks like. And or maybe, a, like maybe validate that every, nothing's changed from a, a CSI um, configuration standpoint. So instead of having to run Cubester as a binary within our operating system, what about incorporating that into our kubectl plugin? So simply put, if you download the binary and I, I'm going to look into how we get Cubester into the, the crew marketplace. So if you're using crew to download your kubectl plugins, which is kind of a, another marketplace and the marketplace world is, is all over the place, um, but lots of options. Um, but basically take your Cubester binary for your operating system, drop it into your local bin and then hyphenate that and then put uh, kubectl hyphen Cubester because then we've got the ability to then run kubectl, kubester, and we could then put all of the other strings, but just to validate that that works, 
now that I'm in the contact, I can run it here as well. And I can run it anytime. And if you've then got aliases built up, you could start to alias this out. And it doesn't really matter where the cubes to binary is. So it just means that we're concentrating on bringing everything into, into one place. So that was just something I stumbled across yesterday. Um, there'll be a massive exploration as to how we can make that easier. And, and really that's the whole point, right? Is that we want to make, like people use crew to deploy, people use kubectl plugins. People just want to go and grab the binary and they want to, maybe they want to change the binary and they want to do their own thing. That's fine. It neither's wrong. Um, and I think that's important as well, is that from a community point of view, there's lots of different ways and options like there always has been for us to do stuff. And I feel like if we can incorporate everyone's needs and requirements, then we're going to get more people looking at, at the project. Um, just to, again, uh, here's the, so I'll make sure there's links as well, but Cubester is, uh, is homed on the Kasten GitHub. But you can see here that we've got an active community of 22 and we've got some uh, valid issues that are out there as well that I'd love for the community to get involved with. Um, but also we've, we've had again, like 140 st or 139 stars. I'd love to see this number grow, like some contribute contributions around that. Even if it's documentation, I, I think I'm not a developer and my first commit or my first uh, input into uh, contributions was very much around the wording within the documentation. You find something else around that that's interesting bit like me finding the Kubester, uh, kubectl plugin i'll probably document that and put that into the readme so that people are aware of that and they can use it but yeah it doesn't have to be writing in golang to understand and be able to do something contributing in general not just for kubester could be anything could be just literally making sure that the the readme is is reading as it should be like walking through that process but i think that's it for the demo but any any questions that was, uh, you know, a question that I probably should have asked before we got started is, you know, prior to having the, you know, the magic button tool like Coopster and also community behind it, because that's really important for troubleshooting, is how long would this, this process normally take? If I'm an end user out there and I want to evaluate these different storage options, we could be talking about days, if not weeks, uh, depending on the level, the technical level that someone brings before getting involved in that kind of process. But I mean, based on your calculations, normally how how long would something like this take? Yeah. So so first and foremost, you've got to, let, let, and let's go with the the hardest part of this, so the evaluation. So you've got to take an application such as FIO. You've then got to build out a container, a Docker container. You've got to store that somewhere. You've got to be able to then pull on that and create your pod within Kubernetes. You've then got to have the logic to be able to create a persistent volume claim on the storage that you require. And already by then, like, okay, we could do that quite quickly with, with YAML files in terms of spinning up a container, but we haven't created, the creating a container takes time. The deployment takes time. The understanding what, or dynamically understanding what the storage is that we want to run it against, it takes time. I don't know if there's a day that we can put against it, but I think you saw how quick it was to run those commands and understand and get some feedback on what it was, where we were, like anyone watching can see that we have various different storage classes available to us within Azure or within our AKS cluster. I think it's like we could, if you were gonna do that manually, you'd have to create uh, PVCs and pods for each individual, uh, potentially each individual storage class, which means you'd have to know the commands to go and find out what they look like, what they are, but it'd be a very long-winded, and that's just the evaluation. Like, and they all work kind of together in that the identifying gives you a good, like, easy way of being able to see. Okay, I've got all of these different storage classes available to me using Intree, using CSI. We've got the validation button, which we want to obviously progress there as well as more functionality becomes apparent within CSI, and then the evaluation. So I think. It would take a long time. I have seen some community members that have gone through that process, very bespoke and having to do that. 
which again just spurred us on to go and create something like Cubester. Yep, I know. I think it's but but that's but that's exactly it. Is that the the human cost, the time cost, the anxiety and uncertainty cost as well too. Is like you know I convinced my boss it was a great idea to you know go for this Kubernetes uh, and running data on Kubernetes and thinking about storage. And then you start to write all these problems and you know you have to you're gonna to have to give some answers uh, it's some pretty uncomfortable questions so i think this is what like we were saying earlier a lot of this what this comes down to is it's making this a calmer and and more predictable and and transparent environment so i, I really definitely think that brings a lot of value can i get you to stop sharing your screen just because we're we're getting towards the end we always gotta yeah, yeah, do cool. some a little bit of a tradition but i got a couple other questions just um just uh just before we finish are there any resources that you would recommend for, you know, when we're talking about data management, running data on Kubernetes, for a lot of people, you know, it's still, you know, early days, or this is something that's, you know, being more and more adopted, we see more and more um, success stories coming out. But for, for folks that just want to start getting into this, what, where would you say are some, uh, some good starting points that you would recommend, or perhaps as well, too, when working with customers, how do you help them get onboarded to this idea of the mindset of working with data on Kubernetes? Yeah, I think to start with storage on Kubernetes now, you, there's tons of resources out there that we know, um, whether it's paid for, whether it's free on YouTube. YouTube has been my like my, my go-to because there's so many good resources there that are focusing in on these like pain points around storage on Kubernetes, persistence on Kubernetes, which all lends itself to the data conundrum, if you like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, YouTube is is by far there's a few few people on there that are doing awesome stuff. Um, we're building something at Caston, which will be at learning.caston.io. I, I don't know how much I can give away on that, but that's that, enough. That's enough. Yeah, Something's yeah. coming. Yeah, there's something there that obviously is going to be very much focused on storage and data management. So yeah, watch that space. A lot of hands on stuff because I don't know about everyone on that's listening in either live or after the fact is that. I find that this community is very much learn by watching, learn by doing yeah. um, versus reading books. Don't get me wrong. I still read books and learn a lot that way, but the hands-on approach, the video, con like the video content is, it seems to be winning a lot of hearts and minds in this space. So expect some, something there as well, but YouTube is my go-to. There's a lot of impartial. Uh, th that's exactly what I've been trying to, instill in in my content as well as much as i work for caston i'm very much for uh, i'm more of a a community I'll, I'll always back the community first but also data in general like having a having a focus around evangelizing data on platforms is is really my focus and then obviously with that i want to make sure that we're secure and and it's safe with with some sort of data protection if it's ours great if not that's fine as well yeah no, but being able to bring those things together is something that, that can be challenging. And like you said as well, I think in terms of credibility from a content creator perspective, if it just constantly bombarding people with, you know, a logo or a product or a mantra or a slogan or things like that, that gets a little bit tiresome. I think you going back to your point though, YouTube and with a lot of folks as well too, because you're like, look, there isn't one magic resource. And also everybody responds to different resources differently. Some people might like content that has uh, you know, that's going to be showing code the whole time. Others might just want to be listening to more of a podcast format. Uh, I think it's a lot of just go out there and, and Google stuff. And, you know, after Google, YouTube's the second biggest search engine anyway. So there's tons of stuff that you can find there. It just, I think if you put the time in, you know, like I listen to, to data or Kubernetes podcasts when I go running. Um, yeah, and yeah. that's great. And I get news and I get lots of things. And when I finish running, then I'll maybe go review things after that. Um, but I think it's mostly just like, sports, whatever, regular discipline and doing things, you know, consistently and building on that is what's going to work best. Yeah. Um, I think like an overall, like a wider learning curve type type tip that I'd say is like, if everyone could just spend and if everyone can commit to 30 minutes, an hour a day, just being inside, like using cube CTL, going to learn that, like I'm forgetting about, forget about the, uh, like the, the storage focus, because that will come, but just being kubectl, understand a bit more. And then if you want to get more into the storage, then focus on that CSI because that wave is absolutely coming from a storage point of view. It's there for a lot of the distributions. But having that, that might be the, and anyone coming into this space that, that is really starting fresh, learn CSI because that will give you a massive foot up and 
yeah, it, it's that's a good area to start from a storage point of view. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that's it. Is that you know we always tell people you know Rome wasn't built in a day. Get the building blocks, and then you can start adding on these other layers, levels of complexity. But once again, as we said in the beginning, don't make this just an individual thing. Get into yeah. some kind of a community so you can bounce ideas off folks and ask them about your DAOs and things like that. Um, good. Well, we are at time, and I'm sure you've got plenty of other things to do. So I uh, just want to share my screen really quickly. When you can see it, let me know. Yeah, yeah I can see it. Good. So while we've been talking, our amazing uh, graphic recorder, Angel, has been uh, drawing this uh, to, to have a visual depiction of what you, uh, a summary of some of the things that were being mentioned. And obviously it was very important to get rugby in there as we started out talking about rugby. Um, so like I said, Michael, you're, you're, you're always welcome to, to, to come and give a talk with us and, and we're gonna be following all the stuff that you're doing. Like I said as well is that, um, we'll probably try to link this stuff later on, but he's done some great podcasts about other stuff. If people wanna find you on YouTube, how do they find you? So I'm at Michael Cade One pretty much everywhere. So uh, my YouTube link is Michael Cade One. My Twitter is Michael Cade one and that door is always open. Twitter is always open. Like if anyone's got any questions as well as in the, the doc um, Slack channel, I'm in there. Um, you can find at Michael Cade. I think I am, but yeah, always open for feedback for like answering questions. Absolutely. That's what we, that's what we're here for. That's great. I think that's why it really is. It's, it's nice. And it's not necessarily that often to have the, the, the nice balance of the technical side and then and also the human side of being a cool and approachable person who's very open. Basically, it's like it, you're, you're easy to find, you're accessible, you're reachable, and you're happy to help. Um, so that's I think that's really what all this community stuff is about. Michael, thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of your, your evening, and we'll be talking soon. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks for all having right. me. Cheers. Nice one.